This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. All right, this is the uh, the first of a few uh, lectures on uh, control accounts, which can be asked in um, really in two different ways, as you'll see as we uh, go through it. Uh, but before I uh, show you the types of questions that can be asked, uh, we do need a little bit of revision of something we did earlier on books of prime entry. Um, and then I can explain what control accounts actually are. And if you haven't watched the, uh, le the earlier lectures on books of prime entry, then do. Uh, because I'm not going to um, go through the entire lecture again. Just a, a tiny bit of quick revision. Just suppose we were making some sales on credit. Now, if you remember from uh, books of prime entry, what we'd do, first of all, is we'd list them in the sales day book. Or, if you remember, the receivables journal, same, name, uh, same thing. Uh, I, I spent some time going through the different names we have for all these different books. Uh, but we would list them, and perhaps we made just three sales. Uh, Mr. A, we sold 100. Mr. B, 200. Mr. C, 300. Now, obviously, there'll be loads more. I, I want to keep this very short. Uh, but all the way through the month, we'd be listing the sales on credit. But so far, if you remember, there'd be no double entry. Uh, at the same time, we'd be making a note of how much each customer owed us um, in the sales ledger. Or again, the other name, the receivables ledger. Where, if you remember, um, this isn't double entry, it's just a note. But in this ledger, we had a page for each individual customer, Mr. A, Mr. B, Mr. C. And we make a note of what the owed is. So in the sales day book, Mr. A owes us 100. We put a debit on Mr. A's page. B owes us 200. C owes us 300. But still, no double entry, we just made a note. Uh, and of course, we'd also be receiving cash. And so, every time we received cash from a customer, uh, it would be in the cash receipts book. And suppose the only receipt from a customer, uh, let's suppose Mr B had paid us $50. Well, in the total column, we'd show the receipt of 50. We'd analyse it. If you remember, we had all these analysis columns. Uh, and here it would be analysed to receivables. Obviously, again, there could be lots and lots of receipts. I want to keep this short. Uh, but again, we've, all we've done is made a note. There's been no debits and credits. Uh, but at the same time, we'd make a note in the um, sales or receivables ledger on Mr B's page. So he's paid us 50. There we are, 50. So that would be going on all month, listing every sale on credit, listing all the cash received, and making the note on the individual's accounts. Uh, at the end of the month, though, we'd come to do the double entries. Uh, receivables journal, or sales day book, we take the total, which is 600, and in the nominal ledger, we do the double entry just on the total. We what would we do? We debit receivables. With the total of six hundred, and the double entry. I'm not going to show the other account, but we'd credit sales. 
And that would be the actual double entry, debit receivables, credit sales, but with the total. And similarly, we'd go to the cash receipts book. Uh, we'd add up the total cash received uh, on receivables. And we'd do the double entry. Remember, we debit cash with all the cash received and then credit whatever the relevant account is, depending on why we'd received it. But as far as receivables are concerned, total cash received, 50. Credit receivables. And there is the actual double entry. And it does mean here that at the end of the month, if we were preparing a statement of financial position, the balance on receivables is 550. That's what we've put on the um, statement of financial position. All we need there is total receivables. But at the same time, it is important we know who owes us the money. And so, whoever's in charge of the sales ledger, the receivables ledger, we'd ask them to prepare a list of balances. And of course, A owes us 100, B owes us 150. Sorry, I'm going to squash a bit here. The balance is 150. Uh, C owes us 300. And they do a list of balances. Who owes us this 550? Uh, a 100. B 150. And C 300. There we are. We know what the total is from the receivables account for the uh, extent of financial position. But also we have this list of balances from the um, receivables or sales ledger. We know who owes us the money. We need that information so that we can chase uh, customers for payment. We need the information so we can check if there are any irrecoverable or doubtful debts. And in addition, it does, as you'll see uh, later when I, we look at exam type questions, it does actually provide a little check on ourselves because uh, all sorts of mistakes could have been made. Uh, I'll just suggest two. Um, maybe we sold a uh, goods for a hundred and we listed it in the receivables journal, no problem. But whoever's writing up the ledger accidentally only put 10 on A's account instead of 100. Uh, obviously that's wrong, but we'd find out there'd been a mistake because when we came to, uh, we, we know, sorry, the receivables account in the nominal ledger, we've entered the right total and the right balance is 550. However, when we come to do the list of balances, if we only had A as though in 10, Obviously, the total is en ends up being different. It's not going to be 550. Uh, we know there's a mistake and we'd have to go and find it. You know, if we don't put A correct, the danger is we only chase him for $10 when in fact he owes us 100. Uh, another example of a mistake, let's put that right. What was 100? Uh, suppose we've put the right figures in the sales day book, the receivables journal. Suppose we have entered them correctly on the individual's account. But at the end of the month, when we came to add up the uh, journal, well, I know there are only three figures here. There's not much room for a mistake. But if you can imagine hundreds and hundreds of figures, it'd be very easy to add up wrongly. And suppose we got the total as only 500. Well, what would be wrong here? Um, the receivables ledger is fine. We've entered the correct amounts. We enter each amount individually. But in the nominal ledger on the receivables account, if we added up and only got 500, we'd have only debited with 500. There'd end up being a different balance. It'd only be 450. It wouldn't agree with the list of balances. We'd know there was a mistake. And we'd better go and find it.
Uh, because if um, if that balance is wrong, we've got the wrong figure on the um, statement of financial position. And so, uh, again, that was uh, a quick bit of revision, and we'll look at some full examples later. However, uh, one bit of terminology. We've got a sales ledger, a receivables ledger, with an account in it for each individual customer. They're all individual receivables. A is a receivable, B is a receivable, C is a receivable. We've also got a receivables account in the nominal ledger. And this, of course, is showing total receivables. But there is a danger of it getting very confusing. If I say, oh, we've got the balance on a receivables account wrong, it's not immediately clear. Am I talking about one of these? Because A, B and C are all receivables accounts. Is it one of those that's wrong? Or if I say balance on receivables account is wrong, do I mean this one, the total receivables? There is that danger uh, of confusion. And so, to avoid that confusion, total receivables account, well, we give it a different name. I mean, the best name would be total receivables account. That would be sensible. And then it's obvious what I'm talking about. Total receivables account is wrong. Fine, you know what I mean. But the other name for it is the control account. Total receivables account in the nominal ledger. Remember, that's the account where we're showing total receivables. We take total uh, sales on credit, total cash received. That's where we do the double entry. Well, the other name for it is Sales Ledger Control Account. Or, well, remember, the other name for the Sales Ledger is the Receivables Ledger. The other name is Receivables Ledger Control Account. So if ever in any type of question you see mention of sales ledger control account or receivable ledger control account, uh, remember it simply means the total receivables account in the nominal ledger. Uh, we call it control account because in a sense it does control, it does check. You know, I said a minute ago that the, um, the total balance on total receivables, the 550, it does check, it does control the receivables or sales ledger. It should equal the total of the list of all the individual balances. So that's all the control account is. And similarly, although I don't here need to do an example, um, we'll have a total payables account in the nominal ledger. That's where we'll show the total purchases on credit from the day book of the journal. We'll show the total cash that's been paid from the cash payments book. And the balance will be the total payables. Well, I'm sure you can guess the other name for that. Because this should equal the total of the individual balances in the purchase ledger, payables ledger. We call it either Purchase Ledger Control Account or, I'm sorry the two names, but I spent enough time on this in the um, Electron Books of Prime Entry, because the other name for the Purchase Ledger is the Payables Ledger. It's also called the Payables Ledger Control Account.
you know, some companies call it purchase under control, some companies call it payables under control. But again, whenever, if ever you see mention of either of those, immediately you know it's the total payables account in the nominal ledger. All right, um, now that was just a, hopefully, really, apart from terminology, revision of uh, what we did in the lecture on books of prime entry. Uh, however, I need to show you three extra entries that could be relevant, which we didn't discuss before, but can be relevant in the sort of exam type questions that we're coming to. And there on the next page, returns, discounts and contra entries. And I, I hope uh, there's no problem with any of these, but let's check. Now I've got a little example on each. So first of all, returns. It says, suppose we sell goods for 500 on credit to Mr. X. So what are we going to do? Uh, I'm not going to go through listing it in all the books again. But if we sell goods on credit, then in the... Um, Receivables ledger, we'll have a page for Mr. X. We sell goods, we'll debit him with 500. And similarly, of course, in the total receivables account, in the control account, we would debit, albeit remember, in this account, We'd be debiting with the total of all the sales on credit. Um, there's obviously like to be a lot more sales. However, it says a week later, Mr. X returns half the goods to us. And we accept the return. You know, people can't automatically return. We've got to give them permission and say, yes, we'll take it back. However, we've accepted the return, and what are we going to do? Well, he was owing us 500. He's given us half the goods back, and so we'll credit him with 250. Now, there'll probably be, uh, just like there's a, a sales journal, uh, uh, or a, a sales day book, a receivables journal, where we li listed all the sales on credit, if people are returning goods, we'll have another book of prime entry, a returns book, where we'd have listed them. However, we'll credit X's page with 250. He now only owes us the balance of 250. And of course, on the receivables account in the nominal ledger, we'll credit with the total of all returns. You know, we'll have a book listing them. There could be lots of returns. Well, the total of them we'll credit to receivables. And where would we debit? Oh, I'm not really concerned for what's coming. But just as when we sold the goods, we would have credited sales. If people return goods, um, you can do one of two things. You would either debit sales, or you could, uh, so the sales obviously, the net sales are lower, or alternatively, you could have an account for returns, but on the um, statement of profit and loss, we take the sales less the returns, so it makes no difference. However, that I'm less concerned about, to be honest, what matters, and I hope that one's clear, is that if a customer returns goods, we'll credit the customer, we'll credit receivables. Uh, next one, discounts. Now, uh, you should know what we mean by a discount, but in fact there are two reasons, two reasons for perhaps giving a discount. One reason uh, you might give a discount is because somebody's a big customer. You know, you, 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 they're a big customer and you say, ah, you're buying so much, we'll give you a 10% discount. 
Now that's called a trade discount. A trade discount is where we give a discount uh, because it's a big customer or they're buying a big quantity. And so uh, maybe we um, sell goods. Uh, the normal price is a hundred. Or oh, if they say a thousand, that's a big quantity. Uh, and we give a discount of 10%. Uh, well, if it's a trade discount like this, then of course, although the normal price is a thousand, we're not charging this person a thousand at all. We'll actually invoice them for a thousand less 10%, so less a hundred. We'll invoice them with 900. And that is the sale. And so uh, we debit receivables, we credit sales uh, with 900. The amount we're actually charging them. And of course, without doing all this books of prime entry business again, it's 900 that would appear on the customer's account. It's 900 that would be included in the total sales on credit that are going to total receivables. So that one, no problem. However, the other reason for giving a discount is to encourage people to pay quickly. We call it a cash discount, but look at the example in the um, back to the page in the lecture notes. It says, suppose we sell goods for a thousand on credit to Mr. Y. We offer him a 5% discount if he pays the invoice within a month. So it's encouraging him to pay early. Obviously, the sooner people pay, the better. And so if he does pay within the month, he can uh, only pay 5% less. If he takes longer than a month, he'll have to pay the full thousand. Now here we treat it differently. And the point is, you see, when we sell the goods, we don't know whether he'll pay early or not. And so when we sell the goods, we have to debit receivables, credit sales, with the full amount. And all right, you'll enter it on this individual page, it'll be entered in total in the receivables account. But uh, uh, we have to enter the full amount because, again, we don't know whether he'll pay early or whether he won't. And you see, if he takes longer than a month to pay, he'll have to pay the full thousand, the debit cash credit receivables. Uh, finished. However, it says here, Mr. Y does pay the account within a month and therefore pays us only 950. Pays within the month, he's entitled to a discount of 5%, 5% of a thousand is 50. So he only pays us 950. And okay, when we get the cash, debit cash credit receivables. Nine fifty, but of course we can't leave it like that. Otherwise, we still show him as owing us fifty, and he doesn't owe us fifty at all. He was entitled to this discount, and so when we get the payment and realise he's taken this discount, we need to clear the balance. We credit receivables with fifty, so the balance now, of course, is zero. And the double entry, 
well, it's costing us 50 to give the discount. We debit discounts allowed. We have a T account, discounts allowed. Debit 50. Uh, and it's an expense, so we're debiting like any expense. And at the end of the uh, period, it'll appear on the statement of profit or loss as an expense. The sales are still a thousand, that's what we sold. The discount is something separate, it was to get in to pay early. You know, in a sense, it's a bit like paying interest when you're borrowing money. It's again to pay early, it's an expense. So on the stem to profit and loss, under the heading expenses, along with rent, telephone, whatever, uh, we'd have discount allowed. And of course, with all these books of prime entry business, not only would we credit receivables, debit discount allowed in the nominal ledger, but you'd also have to credit Mr. Who was it? Mr. Wise Page in the receivables or sales ledger. All right, one more, and this is a little bit unusual, but it's all very easy when I've explained. It's one thing to learn. Something called contra entries. Suppose we sell goods for 800 on credit to Mr. Z. Well, as always, when we sell goods, we'll debit the customer 800. And of course, uh, in the total receivables account, Uh, the 800 will be part of the total, but we will debit receivables credit sales uh, with the sales on credit. Mr. Z also happens to be a supplier, and we buy goods from him for a thousand on credit. Well, what do we do when we buy goods? on credit. Uh, we have our payables ledger. This was the sales ledger, remember? And in the payables ledger, if you buy goods on credit, we credit the supplier. So we'd have a page for Mr. Z. We bought goods uh, for, what was it, a thousand? And also, of course, we'll have our total payables account or our payables ledger control account. And although in this account, remember, we're doing things in total, the total of all the purchases on credit, uh, that thousand will be part of the total. Credit payables, debit purchases, a thousand. And so, Mr. Z owes us money. We owe Mr. Z money. And it may be we pay him in full, credit, cash, debit, um, in with a thousand. Maybe he pays us in full, debit, cash, credit, uh, credit him with 800. No problem. However, instead of him paying us and us paying him, we might agree with him, look back at the question, we agree that instead of him paying us in full and us paying him in full, we'll simply pay him the net amount owing. Uh, we owe him a thousand, he owes us eight hundred. Well, let's just pay him two hundred. Save all the problem. Well, what happens when you pay a supplier credit, cash, debit, payables? We paid him 200, so we'll debit Mr. Z's page with 200. Uh, and of course, in the total payables account, although again, we'd be taking the total of all the cash paid to uh, suppliers, um, including the total, will be that 200 credit cash debit payables. 
However, of course, we can't stop there. If we leave it like that, we still must show Mr. Zebra's owing 800, and the danger is somebody starts ringing him up and demanding payment when he doesn't owe us anything. Uh, we can't show, continue to show us as owing him 800, because again, the danger is uh, somebody in, in our business doesn't realise that he owes us as well, and we end up paying him, which would be stupid. And so what are we going to do? He doesn't owe us anything, we don't owe him anything. Well, we'll just cancel. To cancel them, we'll credit Mr Z's page in the sales ledger with 800. And he doesn't owe us anything. And we'll put a debit on Mr Z's page in the payables ledger. Again, because we don't owe him anything. Now remember, those two are only a note, but we need to make that note in both ledgers. In the nominal ledger, where we're doing our double entries, fine, we'll credit receivables with 800, we'll debit payables. With 800, there's the double entry. But all we're doing is cancelling a receivable against a payable. And it's not going to happen that often, obviously. It's only relevant when you're buying and selling to the same person. But it can happen, it does happen. And so if ever we do decide to do what's happened here and just pay the net amount, or if he owed us more, he just pays us the net amount, then we do need to cancel. Now that entry's got a special name because it's purely a bookkeeping entry. You know, at 800 itself, there's no cash received, there's no cash paid. It's just a bookkeeping entry to put things right. And that sort of entry, and this is the only one you'll see in um, this exam, is called a contra-entry. Oh dear, I can't spell. And a contra-entry is always when you're cancelling a receivable against a payable. The entry always is debit payables to reduce what we owe, credit receivables to reduce what they owe us. And so although I hope I've made sense of it, of the logic, uh, learn it, because in the types of exam questions we're coming to, almost always it's a contra entry appears. And however easy or hard you may find any other bits in the question, contra entry is always easy. You debit payables, you credit receivables, always. All right, well, that's taken me quite a while. I'll stop that lecture here. Uh, the next lecture, though, uh, I'll start going through the two types of exam questions that you can be asked.